Thank you very much, Anne. And welcome, Dr. Selene McNeil. As you can see, the topic is audiological perspectives of cochlear implantation. Dr. Selene McNeil is a fully qualified audiologist holding a Bachelor of Applied Sciences in Speech and Hearing, a Master's of Audiology and a PhD in Many Years Disease from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Dr. McNeil is a specialist audiologist, treating sufferers of Many Years Disease with their hearing needs and other hearing issues. She practices at Healthy Hearing and Balance Care, Bondi Junction, New South Wales. This webinar tonight is a follow-up of Professor Gibson's webinar on all you want to know about cochlear implants. Selene will talk, talk us through the audiologist's perspective of cochlear implants and the processes we need to go through after surgery. Thank you, Dr. Selene, over to you. Good night, everyone. Oh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for logging in tonight. And thank you, Anne, Regina, and Lynn for organizing the event. So I'm going to talk to you about my experience as an audiologist working with cochlear implants and mostly about cochlear implants and the results in many years disease. So just an overview of what a cochlear implant is. A cochlear implant is a hearing aid-like system which has a surgically implanted component and that connects with an external part. The external part is known as sound processor or speech processor. So the cochlear implant uses electrical stimulation instead of acoustic signal to send the external sound directly to the brain. So it bypasses the cochlea where the damage is when there's a hearing loss. So this uh, picture here shows here the, the internal part. So that's what the actual implant looks like. And that's what the surgeon will insert. And the insertion goes, as you can see here, so there's a knee here, and you can see that this part, which is the receiving antenna and the magnet, sits just under the skin behind the ear. And then the actual electrode array is inserted inside the cochlea. So this is the surgeon's part, nothing to do with the audiologist. What is to do with the audiologist is this external part, the processor. So what you have here is a, what we call a behind the ear processor. So in every speech processor or every sound processor has a transmitter or a coil, has a magnet, has a cable that connects the um, uh, coil to the speech processor, has a microphone, and there's batteries. So the internal component, uh, the, uh, the actual implant, there's a, there are different models. Some are more flexible than others. Some have more electrodes than others. Some are longer than others. But this is all uh, the job of the, the ENT to choose which one is more appropriate to a particular patient. And the different makers have different design uh, electrode arrays. So I found as I was preparing for this talk, I found this very useful chart. It was uh, designed by a group in America, a group of uh, cochlear implant recipients. And I would encourage people to go through online and find this because there's information about all the technical aspects in a lot of detail, comparing the three different manufacturers available currently. And I think this is quite useful because a lot of people, or most people have the, the dilemma, which device should I, should I choose? And this choice is something that only you can make. Nobody else can make it for you. And once this choice is made, there is no way back because a cochlear implant is not like a hearing aid, because a hearing aid, you can choose, you can try, if it doesn't work, you can go for a different model. A cochlear implant, once it's surgically inserted, to replace, you need to have another surgery, okay? So once you choose a manufacturer, you are bound to life with this manufacturer, okay? So the external components will change over time 
but they always have to be from the same manufacturer, okay? So this is just an overview about the three manufacturers available in Australia at the moment. So Advanced Bionex has been in Australia, I think, don't quote me on that, but I think for about 10 years now. And they belong to the Sonova Group. The Sonova Group is a, a large company that owns Phonak hearing aids, Unitron hearing aids, Hansetone hearing aids, amongst others. They are based in California in the US. And they seem to hold 20% of the world market in cochlear implants. Cochlear Limited is the Australian made uh, company. They are a listed company. They've been in Australia producing implants since 1981. And they, they seem to hold 55% of the world market. Medell is an Austrian company. It's been in Australia for about 20 years. And it's a private company owned by a couple of doctors. So there's also uh, the optical uh, medical Neurolac implant. So the Neurolac implant was, was a French device that was uh, bought by Audicom Medical a few years ago. And unfortunately, a few months ago, they had a recall. So one of the implants failed and that resulted in they have to recall it, explant people. And this is something that unfortunately has happened to all the manufacturers at some point in time. So it's not unknown of but unfortunately happened to Oricol Medical in recent times. So what that uh, made uh, happen for them is that they stopped uh, doing implants in Australia altogether. And as it turned out in recent times, on a couple of days ago, actually, it was announced that Cochlea Limited has or is in the process of buying Neurolac. So they will take responsibility for all the people who are implanted worldwide with this device. So this is a, an overview of the, the commercial aspects of cochlear implants, okay? So now in terms of types of sound processes, that's what matters to us as recipients and to us as audiologists. So there are basically two types. So in the same way as hearing aids have different types, you have hearing aids that are behind the ear, you have hearing aids that are in the ear. With the cochlear implants, you have the speech processor that goes behind the ear, like this one in the picture here, or you have the one as they call the off the ear, that the whole unit is in one piece and it's attached to the head on the mag, uh, or, or through the magnet in the same way as the coil is attached to the, the head via the magnet on the behind the ear processor. So in terms of hearing results, there's not much difference between one or the other. It's just the convenience or inconvenience of one against the other. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So, oh, I don't know why this slide came like that. Ooh. Ah, it's coming up. <laughs> okay, so. Again, I took this picture from that uh, comparison chart that I spoke before. So currently, Advanced Bionics has uh, the Naida model and the uh, Naida Sky model. So these are the Marvel and the Sky. These are the two current models for Advanced Bionics. So Advanced Bionics at this point in time only have behind the ear models. Cochlear Limited has the, the CP1000, which is a behind the ear model, and has the Cancel 2, which is the off the ear model. Medell has the Sonnet 2 as the behind the ear and the Rondo 3 as the off the ear. So the three manufacturers and the same behind the ear or off the ear come with a remote control like a hearing aid again, so you can change parameters on the, the device, volume, different programs, access telecoil and things like that via the remote control. So all the devices have a magnet and the magnet needs to be right for the individual person. So the magnet can't be too tight because if it's too tight, it can bruise the skin and that's something that you need to look out for. 
and if it's too loose, it's going to fall off. So you always have to find the, the right magnet. It's not a big deal. It's something that we choose in the clinic and it's very easy to replace. And some people need to replace over time. So the off the ear processor is a very popular device. A lot of people love the idea of not having anything sitting behind the ear, which I can appreciate that because it's a bit of weight, it's a bit uncomfortable. The off the ear, you don't even feel it's there. But the fact that you don't feel it's there makes it very easy for you to lose it. So you can suddenly brush it off. I had patients, for example, taking a jumper off the device flings. So for that reason, they all come with a little, what they call the, the retention line. So that's something that you attach, as you can see on the picture here, attach to the device, and then you either clip on your hair, or on your glasses, or on your clothes. So that's for security reasons, okay? So this is the drawback of having the off the ear. So it is off the ear, but it's attached to you either on your hair or on your clothes. So you have to have that in mind, okay? It is more cosmetic appealing, cosmetically appealing, but you will always have the issue of having to have the clip. So in terms of parts, um, things break with cochlear, with speech processor, like any device. And usually things that can break are the coil, the cable, the cable breaks quite easily and needs to be replaced from time to time. Mostly the manufacturers give you spare parts in, the, in your first kit, but after a while you need to, to pay for the, the replacement when it breaks. Another ongoing is the microphone cover. So all the different manufacturers that have different microphone covers and these covers are to protect the microphone because moisture and dust can get into the microphone and that will compromise the sound quality. So they have covers like this is the most popular at the moment and they change from time to time as the new model comes in the design of the, the, the filters and, and covers change, but I, currently it's mostly a cover like that. And this is expense. So every three months or so, you need to replace this cover. Uh, and again, the manufacturers offer you some in the first kit, but I think three or four depends on how generous the manufacturers feel at the time. And after a while you will have to pay for those parts. So it's something to have in mind. There are ongoing expenses, like with any technology, okay? So in terms of controls, all the, the speech processes have some controls in the, the same way again as hearing aids. So you can change on the button on the actual device. You can change volume, you can change program, you can start streaming. But you can also use a phone app to do that these days. So the phone apps are uh, very rapidly replacing remote controls. So you can change things either on the actual device or with the remote control that comes with the device or using the app dedicated to that particular manufacturer. So in terms of connectivity and accessories, um, most or all of them, all the, the current devices from all three manufacturers have some way of streaming directly uh, to mobile phones, computers, and tablets. This is really the latest trend in technology when it comes to hearing. Hearing aids are doing the same and cochlear implants tend to follow what hearing aids uh, do and develop. The thing with cochlear implants, because uh, the regulation is a lot more restrict, obviously, obviously, because it's a surgical device. So it takes a lot longer for the technology to be released in the market. So what we see is that cochlear implants are usually a, one or two steps behind hearing aid technology. They tend to follow the same, uh, the same trends but a little bit later because it takes longer for the approval to come through when you talk about cochlear implants than with hearing aids for obvious reasons, yeah? 
But at this point in time, most of the processes connect directly to phones but some of them still require an interface. So there'll be something that you'll be wearing either around your neck or clipping to your lapel. And this will make the connection between the phone and the processor, okay? But uh, most of them are already streaming directly with no need for interface, okay? So, and this is just an example of connectivity. So another important thing to consider when you talk about connectivity is that a lot of people wear a cochlear implant in one ear and a hearing aid on the other side. That's quite common. And that's what we call the bimodal fitting. So and when you have bimodal fitting, it's quite good to have a hearing aid that's actually compatible with the cochlear implant. Manufacturers like cochlear and, and AB have dedicated hearing aids that's compatible with their device. So Cochlear, for example, went into partnership with GN Resound, which is a, a very well-established hearing aid uh, manufacturer. And they design hearing aids that talk to the Cochlear implant. When I say talk to the Cochlear implant, means the hearing aid and the Cochlear implant can be connected to the phone. So you're gonna have the phone uh, signal going to both ears at the same time. And that's quite a convenience because when you have a hearing loss, to have the phone stream to both ears gives you more clarity of sound, okay? So, and the AB also has, because it's the same company as Phonak, right? So and Phonak again, a very well established hearing aid company and they have connectivity between the two devices. So the cochlear implant and the hearing aid talk to each other in, in, in not only connecting to the phone, but also in the processing. So when there's change happening on the side of the implant, the hearing aid is notified by the implant and vice versa. So they tend to do the changes together. So say if there's a lot of noise and the processor will reduce the noise because all the, the the algorithms and the technology allows for that to happen automatically. So when you have a hearing aid that's compatible with the cochlear implant, these changes will happen to both sides, okay? So this can be an advantage for some people. But having said that, it's not every phonak hearing aid that talk, talks to the AB device, it's a specific uh, model and the same with the GN resounds. Not every GN resound hearing aid that will talk to the cochlear implant. So there's specific models that will do that. Medell doesn't have any partnership with any of the hearing aids, but they are now developing a, a, a way of streaming to both using the different hardware. Still early days, there's still a lot of growing pains with technology and streaming. A lot of people are still having problems. There's a lot of dropouts with this connection, but it's something that based on hearing aid technology, we see that will be resolved quite quickly. But at this point in time, there are a lot of growing pains going on. So there are the accessories that you can uh, use connected to your implant to fa facilitate your ability to hear television, to hear sounds coming from the computer. And this can be uh, things like the, the television streamer, the Roger Payne, that's a, a remote microphone. You have neck loops like this one here that you can connect to your phone via this device. We have uh, remote microphones again that uh, you can, for example, give the microphone to your partner in a noisy environment and the partner will talk and the sound goes straight to your cochlear implants. So this is the same as hearing aid technology. So for people who've been wearing hearing aids for a long time, for people who have been severely, uh, 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 with severe hearing loss, they usually, access these devices. So, uh, not so much people with Meniere's disease because most people with Meniere's disease have hearing loss in one ear only. So their difficulties usually does not warrant the need for these devices, but some will 
use that. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the batteries. So every device is operated on batteries. Uh, and uh, most of them, but not all, can be operated using either disposable or rechargeable. And that's, you can do either or. So disposable are usually the size seven, uh, 675 battery, which is the largest uh, hearing aid battery available. And usually the device take two or three cells. Uh, the rechargeable varies, for example, the Medell, the Ronda Medell is just on a pad, like you see in the picture here. So you just put the device on the pad overnight and it charges. The Cochlear Kenzo has a very groovy box that you, is a charger and it's also a dehumidifier and sanitizer. So quite handy. So you just put the device in the box overnight and it recharge the battery. And then you can have the other batteries for the behind the ear models, like the AB, this is the rechargeable, and this is the battery here. This is another one of the Medell, so the little batteries here, and the, you put in the charger overnight. This one is the cochlear charger, so you, you can charge two batteries at the same time with this, this device overnight. Okay. So in terms of battery life, Again, I got this chart from the same group that I spoke before. And what they're uh, stating here is what the manufacturers claim their battery life is for the specific devices. So you can see that the, the Naida Marvel, the AB device, if you use the small rechargeable battery, you can get a maximum of nine hours out of it. The medium, because they have different size batteries as well. The rechargeable can be different sizes. So, and you can have up to 18 hours if you're wearing the waterproof cover. Um, and the, nu the cochlear nucleus, the, the behind the ear model with the compact battery, you can get 19 hours. With the standard battery, you can have 40 hours, up to 40 hours. With the cancel, only up to 18 hours. And this is an issue that I'm gonna to talk to you about in a minute. The sonnet from Adele the, with the micro battery up to seven hours with the standard up to 10 hours. So as you can see, you need to recharge these things every single night, right? So if you don't recharge every single night, you, be, you may be let down with no, no sound suddenly, okay? So you need to be organized and, and recharge your batteries if you're going to use rechargeables. But even if you use uh, the, the disposable, the life is not that long. And that can be quite expensive, the disposable batteries, if you have to pay for your own batteries. So the issue with the cancel at the moment is that they are saying that the, the Battery may last up to 18 hours, but it's not for every patient that it lasts for up to 18 hours. So, so much so that Cochlis are advising us not to open the pack. If you're going to do a switch on of a Kenzo 2, you will receive the Kenzo 2 for the patient, but we also have in the clinic a demo model. So we will do the switch on with that demo model and then during the switch on after you have your map, and I will explain all that in a minute, but after you have your map, the software will tell us what is the expected life uh, of that battery for, for that particular patient with that particular map. So if the, the battery life is, is less than 14 hours, I would not recommend you use that, uh, the, the Kenzo, because you can be let down with that battery life. So it might be better off for you to have a behind the ear model. So now I'm just, as I'm talking, I'm looking at the, at the sonar. I must apologize because I didn't really read this chart in, to, uh, in full before the presentation now. But what I'm thinking here, the 10 hours from the sonar too, I don't really think it is accurate. Because from memory, I have a few patients with the sonnet too, and it lasts more than that. So I don't think it's fair to Medell to say that their battery life is just that. I need to look at, at that and get back to you. But in any case, the, 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 the message here is 
You have to charge your processor every night if you're using a rechargeable battery. If you use a disposable battery and if you have to pay for your batteries, it can be very expensive because they go through batteries a lot faster than a hearing aid does and they take more than one battery at a time. And if you're considering the Kenzo 2, it's a great device, but it's not uh, for sure that you'll be able to have it. You will only know if the Kenzo will work for you at switch on, okay? So now there's been questions about swimming with the implant and when it's raining, what do we do? So in terms of swimming, all of them have some type of waterproof cover that you purchase separately. So they have the examples here. This is the, the way the AB deals with water. This is the way the cochlea, um, this is cochlea, I think this is AB again, deals with, no, this is cochlea, sorry. This is cochlea, this is AB here. This is also cochlea Kenzo, this is Medel, and this is Medel. So all of them have some kind of cover that you purchase separately and that can be, you can swim with that, no problems. And in terms of rain, they, without the covers, they are all splash proof. So it's like a hearing aid. If you're caught in the rain, you're not gonna be drenched. You're just gonna look for cover, you're gonna get an umbrella. So as long as you don't get drenched with the, the device, it's not a big deal, okay? But if you're going to swim and put your head under the water, then you use your, your water cover. Right. So now another question that I've been asked by Anne is that to explain to the audience what is the role of the audiologist in cochlear implantation. And I would say that the role of the audiologist is fundamental. Without the audiologist at this point in time, I'm not saying that this is going to be forever, but at this point in time, without an audiologist, you can't have a cochlear implant. You need to have first the audiologist to do the assessment because the audiologist tests is what we're going to determine if you are a suitable candidate for a cochlear implant or not. So our, the audiologist test results is what provide the evidence whether a cochlear implant will be more beneficial than a conventional hearing aid. Because you will only have a cochlear implant if a hearing aid is not going to provide you enough benefit, right? Because other than that, why would you go through surgery if you're going to get the same or worse result, right? So uh, audiologists are equipped to find that out with the tests that we can do. And we can also, we also follow guidelines and we have experience derived from group data that shows what, uh, uh, you know, the average performance of a cochlear implant is co in comparison to what the particular patient in front of you at the time is doing. So we can say, look, you will benefit from a cochlear implant because the hearing aid is not doing enough for you at this point in time. So after that is decided, then is when you should see the surgeon. Okay, before that is frivolous because the surgeon cannot tell you if you are going to benefit unless you go through the tests. So in, the audiologist does the tests. So the surgeon is consulted after that. So after the decision that yes, you are a candidate, then the, the surgeon will assess your anatomy, your medical history and see if you are physically fit to receive the cochlear implant. And then the final decision really needs to come from the candidate and the family, right? Nobody else can make this decision for you, okay? So there are ongoing visits to the audiologist for the rest of your life. And I say for now, because uh, technology is evolving as we know, and there's a lot of do it yourself, things happening more and more. So, and the hearing aid manufacturers and the cochlear implant manufacturers are all researching uh, strategies and techniques and technology that will allow the end user to perform all the required services. So there, are, there will be a time that people will be able to do their own 
adjustments and programming of cochlear implants. There's no doubts about that. But at this point in time, it's not yet available. And having said that, uh, there were always going to be people who are not tech savvy and they don't want to do it themselves. So the audiologists will always be available for that. But at this point in time, the audiologist provides lifetime support and this is ongoing. So every person who has a cochlear implant requires regular naps at least every 12 months if you want optimum hearing. Because what happens is if you live for a long time, it's like, let's just think about your car. If you want optimum performance of your car, you need to service regularly. So same with cochlear implants, same with hearing aids. So, and the big thing with cochlear implants, you, you need to map from time to time to make sure everything is in good working order internally and with the, the processor. So the other thing that the audiologist does on a regular basis is monitoring your ears, making sure there's no wax blocking your ears, making sure there's no infection there. So this is all something that the audiologist regular does by looking your ears every time you go and see them. They check your hearing and if you have a cochlear implant on one ear and you have reasonable hearing or hearing loss on the opposite ear, it's important to keep monitoring the hearing on the other side as well. Because the hearing may progress to a point that you may need a cochlear implant on the other side as well. So there's a lot of people who wear two cochlear implants. So, so these are all the work of the audiologist. And that's all something that you have to have in mind. So this relationship, cochlear implant recipient and audiologist is lifetime for now. So in terms of funding, I always say, if you wanna have a hearing problem, you better live in Australia because Australia is very lucky in terms of funding that is available for, uh, for hearing services. So in terms of cochlear implants, all the health funds in Australia pay for the, the implant in full, for the hardware in full. It's uh, uh, more than $20,000, the cost of the, the, the internal external parts together. And the, the funds, if you are on top cover, they will cover that in full for now. It's been like this for more than 20 years. And they also upgrade the processes because they switch processes from time to time, there's an upgrade and the upgrades are usually back compatible, back compatible with your internal part and the funds will come to the part and replace at no cost to you. In the very recent past, most, fu most funds were replacing every three to five years. There's been some change in recent times. One of the funds have changed from five to 10 years. So things are changing. And in the current economic climate, I won't be surprised if things get worse in that department. So something to have in mind also for those who are battling if I should have a cochlear implant now or live for later, I think when thinking about funding, at the moment, funding is very good. Whether it's gonna continue, I don't know. So the other thing that's very good in, uh, in Australia is the hearing services program. So most of you will be familiar with that program. So which is uh, the Commonwealth program that pays for hearing services for pensioners and for children from birth to 26 years of age. So everybody in between is in the private market, but children up to 26 and age pensioners uh, can have everything free in terms of hearing services, including hearing aids and batteries and everything. With the cochlear implants, what they offer is repairs, parts and batteries. So if you are eligible to the HSP to the hearing services program because you are on a pension, you will be able to get all the repairs and parts and batteries 
free of charge from the hearing service program. And that's something that you, after you have your implant, you have to register with one of the hearing, uh, hearing of how the corner, they're called Hearing Australia, they used to call Australian Hearing, now they're called Hearing Australia. So you have to register one of the Hearing Australian clinics. They are all over Australia. And by registering, you have to also pay an annual uh, fee of I think $47 and something. And with that annual fee, you are eligible to all the parts, repairs and batteries. So that's quite a good thing. But if you are not in that category of eligibility, you are on your own and you have to pay for parts, repairs and batteries and services if your provider charge the fee. So in terms of public and private practices, in Australia, we've got a mix. We've got a lot of charity institutions that provide cochlear implant services. We have public hospitals who have a little, uh, a little bit of funding to provide cochlear implants for eligible or for public patients. The charity institutions, they of course, uh, are funded by mostly charity, but also by a little bit of Medicare, a little bit of NDIS. So there's a pool of, of money that comes from different funds. So charities uh, do not charge the recipients, but you have to have in mind that you are, if you are in the workforce and if you can afford the services, you will be taking the place of somebody who may not be able to afford. So I think this is something that Australians have to have in mind. Everything is, it's very good to have everything free, but not everything is really free. Okay, somebody's paying for the services. So, and I'm a bit biased here because I work in a private practice. So I have no funding from nowhere. So the funding to, to support a private practice comes from what, the fees that the patients pay, or the Medicare that can be uh, uh, claimed on behalf of the patient. So, and the same for surgeons. There are private surgeons and there are public surgeons. So the public surgeons are paid by the public hospitals. The, the private surgeons are paid by the, the health funds or by the fees that they charge the patient. So all these are, you know, financial issues that we all need to talk about. And that's part of, of the hearing service in Australia. So another thing about uh, cochlear implant, the large institutions, some of them, which is a problem, they provide cochlear implants, but they do not provide hearing aids. And if you have a hearing aid in one side, one ear and a cochlear implant on the other ear, that can be a problem because that means you have two audiologists. You have the cochlear implant audiologist and the hearing aid audiologist. And in my mind, that's not ideal. So I think if you have a hearing aid and a cochlear implant, ideally you would see an audiologist that can do both. And there are a lot of audiologists in private practice like me who provide very good uh, cochlear implant services, especially in Sydney, okay? So now a question that always come is when do, to switch on the implant? So. You decided that you're gonna have an implant, you see a surgeon, you have the implant done. And should we implant straight, should we switch the device on straight away? Yes, you can, there's no problems with that. The, the device will work straight away. But you have to think that you went through surgery, you had a general anesthetic, you have stitches on your head, you'll be tired. So, the, the, the procedure, the surgical procedure, as Professor Gibson explained at the last webinar, it's not complex. It's a very simple surgery. Most people come in, in and out of hospital in a day, but it is surgery, right? So, and there's a wound there that's sensitive. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt, but it's sensitive. So you don't wanna straight away go and put a magnet there and hang something behind your ear. So that can be uncomfortable. So I don't see there is a need to rush into switching it on. I usually find that 
two weeks after surgery is quite a good time for most people. Some people even take longer than that, depends on their post-op, because sometimes, not often, but sometimes there are complications. Sometimes people have dizziness after the, the, the surgery. Sometimes they get an infection on the wound. You know, surgery, anything can happen. So, so that's why we can't really say for sure for each individual patient, when is my switch on? It may be in two weeks, maybe four weeks, and it doesn't matter. The end result doesn't matter if you do straight away, two weeks, a week, or a year later. The results will be pretty similar in the end, okay? The only time that I think there's a hurry to switch on is if the, the person going through surgery comes out of surgery with no hearing at all in both ears. So if that person is completely deaf and is relying on the implant to get back on air, obviously we want to switch it on as soon as possible. But everybody else who comes out of surgery with some functional hearing there's no hurry. Make sure your wound is healed, you're feeling well before you can have your switch on, okay? Um, sorry, just excuse me, somebody's coming to vacuum my room. Sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 I'm not gonna call. Oh, no. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and call you. I never stay here after hours and the cleaners just came to vacuum the room. Sorry about that. Okay, so back to the switch on. So I think there's no hurry to switch on, but it's possible to do at any time as soon as the device is in, okay? So now the switch on process. So we call switch on the act of connecting the external part to the internal implant. So at the switch on, the, the audiologist will find the right strength magnet that will stick to your head without being too tight, without being too loose, and put it on your head, connect that to the computer, and the computer will do some automatic measures. And then, the computer that will measure uh, first the impedance of each electrode. So as uh, you know from Professor Gibson's talk, the, uh, the electrode array of the cochlear implant has several electrodes and each electrode will respond to certain pitch, certain sounds, some low pitch going all the way to high pitch sounds. So the, the software, the computer software will measure first the impedance of each one of those electrodes. So uh, for example, Medell has 12 electrodes, AB has 16 electrodes, Cochlear has 22 electrodes. So the software measures all of that and identifies if they are all working. Sometimes there's problems with electrodes. You can have a short circuit, you can have an open circuit and the software will find that out. And if that's the case, it will automatically disable the offending electrode and no harm will be done to either patient or the device. So all the research has shown that even if you disable a lot of the electrodes, as long as you're left with eight electrodes, the end result can be quite all right. So no panic if some of the electrodes don't work at time of switch on. It happens, not all the time, but it can happen and it's not a big deal, okay? So the process of programming or mapping as we call, is the process of finding out the amount of electric current required at each electrode to provide the recipient with comfortable hearing levels at every different pitch that that H electrode provides. So we go through this process at the first switch on. So we check each electrode, we go increasing the current until it's loud and comfortable. And also sometimes, not always, but because I'm here to tell you the bad and the good, 
I'm giving a little bit of the bed as well. So sometimes you get some side effects from certain electrodes, never from all, but some electrodes can cause some side effects. These side effects could be some eye twitching, could be some facial twitching, could be some pain in the ear or in the eyes. Some people get dizzy by stimulating certain electrodes. If this is the case, it's a very short-lived symptom. It's not going to be carrying on. It's just as you st uh, or the audiologist stimulates the electrode. But as soon as we notice there's some side effect, we immediately either disable the electrode or change the parameters, widening the electric current so that the, the symptom will disappear. Because of course, you don't want to wear something that you're causing side effects and that's not the case, not gonna happen. But that's all part of the switch on process. So again, if uh, there is any side effects, we disable the electrode, the audiologist does that manually and everything is fine. So at the time of switch on, most patients are able to recognize sound as you stimulate the electrode. So they will recognize like a beep or like a screechy sound. So they all have different descriptions of what they describe. And some of them can even tell the difference in pitch. And say, oh, this is more high pitched than that. This is softer, this is louder. Most people can do that straight away at switch on. Some people don't do that immediately, it takes a little bit longer, but with a little bit of training and perseverance, we all get there. So it's, it's a very individual process. Not everybody gets there at the same time, okay? So everybody is an individual. So the MAPS, mapping session, as I said, I prefer two weeks at least post-op, but it's all flexible. We usually require three or four sessions immediately after the first switch on. Because what we are after is what we call a stable map. So a stable map means that you're having a stable amount of current for each electrode, and that's not going to need to change over time. But at the beginning, while the healing is happening in the cochlea, the implant is settling in the cochlea, the, the amount of current varies. The, the amount of current that will give you the best perception of sound varies. So for that reason, we need to remap more often. So, and this is, for example, you come in, we do the map, you're hearing reasonably well, you go home happy. After a while, you say, oh, it's not sounding right anymore. So that's because things change and you need to remap. And that's normal. That's the usual process. That's the way it is. But after three or four sessions, the map became stable. And once the map became stable, which means it doesn't change, the electrodes don't change anymore, you will just need to come back every six or 12 months. And that's every six or 12 months for the rest of your life. Some patients with many S disease uh, come more regular. I have a few patients who come every three months. And this seems to be because of the active many years process that still happens in the cochlea. Because the fact that you have many years and you have a cochlear implant does not mean that your many years is gone, okay? So there's still activity, the cochlea is still alive, there's still activity there. So there's still changes in the endolymphatic uh, um, fluid, right? So, and this change can affect the performance of the electrodes. So that means you need to come to the clinic more often so that the sound of your cochlear implant is always at it, its best, okay? Because other than that, the sound may be not as clear, a little bit muffled or... And the other one is that the change of the microphone cover also very important to do regularly to ensure the best sound clarity, okay? Okay, so the rehabilitation process, not everybody needs that. That's also very interesting. And with many patients, I always see from time to time, or actually more often than not, 
that their rehab is quite quick. And these are the people usually who have been wearing hearing aids all along. Because the fact that the brain is continuously being stimulated with sound ensures that once you, you turn the cochlear implant on, it's not so much of a shock. Because if you did not stimulate the ear for a long time, so say you have only one hearing ear or you have a hearing aid on one ear and you don't do anything on the affected side and you live for a very, very long time, the brain starts losing memory of sound. So when you turn the cochlear implant on, the brain does not make sense of that sound. It will eventually, but not immediately, okay? And that's when uh, the, the auditory training is important because the auditory training will facilitate that improvement of sound perception, okay? It is very much like learning a foreign language, all right? So it's like, say, you go to Japan and you don't speak Japanese. You can hear, you can hear everything, but your brain can't tell what it, what it means. So it's similar with that. So you put the cochlear implant in, in an ear that has not been stimulated for a very, very long time. Once you switch it on, the brain hears, yes, I'm hearing, but I don't know what I'm hearing. It doesn't make sense. It's distorted. A lot of people say initially it sounds like a chipmunk and sounds robotic and this and that. So there's all these different descriptions that people make out of the sound that they first hear. But our brain is very plastic. So if you have a healthy brain, you will make sense quite quickly. Okay, so it's a lot to do with brain plasticity, as we call. And brain plasticity is the ability of your brain to make new neuronal connections, okay? And it's well known that some people have that better than others. Children has obviously that a lot faster than adults. The older we get, the harder these connections become. But having said that, there are 100-year-old patients that have cochlear implants and responded, right? So age is a factor, but also individuality comes to play. You can, have, have, you can be an old person with a healthy brain, and you can be a young person with an old brain, okay? So brain plasticity has a lot to, to, to play in cochlear implant rehabilitation, all right? So in terms of auditory training, there are a lot of apps, a lot of computer software that facilitates this training. It's very much like computer games. So you just play some games, listening to words, listening to, to syllables, listening to isolated sounds. So your audiologist should be able to recommend what's best for you at that point in time, okay? So there's no one size fits all. It's like everything else. You have to look at each individual per person to see what's most suitable to help in the rehabilitation process, okay? Uh, a very good thing for, for rehabilitation is listening to audiobooks. So anything that makes you force into listening through that ear with the implant will speed up your ability to understand clearly from the implant. And especially these days with this connectivity. So if you can connect your cochlear implant directly to your phone or to your tablet or to your computer, you can have this stimulation going directly to that ear and by that way exercising and train your, your brain to hear from that side. So another question that came up is if we're going to lose residual hearing. So residual hearing is the amount of hearing that you had before you went to the implant. Uh, some people have, most people have some residual hearing before they go to the implant. This question about if you're going to lose your hearing or not is best addressed to the surgeon because it's up to them to save your hearing. Uh, it's during surgery that that process happens. Sometimes they can't help it, but sometimes it can be helped. Um, and also depends on the type of electrode, on the skill of the surgeon. So it's something that you need to discuss with your surgeon. 
But the question is also, we are preserving hearing and why are we preserving here? That's some question that still hasn't been answered because if you're going to have a cochlear implant, what are you going to do with your residual hearing? You're never gonna use it. The only point to consider, but it's still we are learning, we don't know much about it, is if in the near future, hair cell regeneration becomes a reality in the clinic, we don't know that if people who had uh, their residual hearing preserved will be able to use the uh, hair cell technology, uh, hair cell regeneration technology. We don't know. So this is something that we are learning as we go. So whether it is really important to preserve hearing or not, it is a little bit debatable at this point in time. But I know that it's possible, and some surgeons are very, very good at doing that. But again, depends on the electrode use. Some electrodes seem to be more destructive than others. So a question to the surgeon, okay? Uh, I think I spoke already about that. So what's the process of understanding a new signal? So it's very much like learning a new language, depends on brain plasticity. So I think I have said all that. So the other question, does normal hearing on one side will affect the ability of the brain to make sense of the signal that comes from the implant? Look, yes and no depends again on brain plasticity. I have a few young people who had perfectly normal hearing in one ear and for different reasons, completely lost hearing on the opposite side. I, I from memory had three people on that category, very young on the uh, one on the, two of them in their mid twenties, one in, in his early thirties. And the result was, absolutely magnificent from the word go. So the brain did not have any problems to integrate the sound from both sides. One being normal hearing, the other one being the electronic hearing from the cochlear implant. And they performed quite well. They liked the sound, there was no rejection. I had other patients on the other hand, much older patients who could not tolerate the difference in signal. And this is the brain would not uh, be flexible enough, if you could say like that, to start paying attention of the signal because you need to divide your attention. The brain attention needs to be divided to both sides and then to integrate the signal from both sides, right? So you need to be able to receive the signal from the implant, receive the signal from your normal hearing, which is what you're used to and learn the new way. So some brains don't want to learn the new way, so they reject the new way and they keep just paying attention on the good side. So these are the people who end up rejecting the implant. Not many, but possible. So always be mindful that it is possible, okay? So the thing about single-sided deafness, so say if you're completely deaf in one ear, there is nothing to lose going through an implant, right? So you, you're not gonna lose your hearing. But say, if you still have some hearing and you have a hearing aid that's still functioning, there is something to lose, okay? So if the cochlear implant doesn't work, you're not going back to the, the hearing aid, right? So that's something to have in mind. So now the question about many is, do they have good results? And I say a very big yes. Many years usually have excellent results. And this is because the auditory nerve is intact. The brain is intact. Many years disease causes a problem on the cochlea only. And the cochlear implant bypasses the cochlea. So because of that, cochlear implants in many years disease are very successful. But Again, goes back to the same thing. If you have an ear with Meniere's disease that has not been stimulated for a very long time, the process is a lot longer than somebody who has been stimulated all the time. Okay, so I think we reached the hour. 
I've got a couple more here. I don't know if you want me to go through or if we should just break for questions. Maybe, um, Selene, we might need to break for questions. Yes. But, um, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. I think I went a little bit overboard here. So. No, it, it was wonderful. <laughs> absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you maybe stop sharing so that we yeah. can all see you? Okay. Yes, um, thank you. Is that all right? Is it working now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna excuse me for a sip of water. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So, Selena, okay. yeah. Thank you so much for your whole presentation. It was so great, so comprehensive, and full of information and advice. You've covered so much in this time. And I'm seeing that there are only a couple of questions, and I'm inclined to think Julianne says. My Kenzo 2 battery lasts for around 30 hours. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting for you to know. Yes. And then, Anthony, I'm not sure whether your questions have already been answered in what has just been recently said. He asks about future proofing the processor once it's inserted. And you did talk about that. So, Anthony, yeah. if you want to know any more, please write another quick message. And the other one was, Will that cochlear implant work on someone who's still got some hearing in comparison who has none, like having a labor infectomy? Um, I suspect you've answered that question too. Okay. Okay, Megan says big thanks. Anthony says a little bit off topic, but can an ECG test confirm many airs high drops and confirm that there is no many airs high drops. ECG, electrocardiography, yeah. or electrocochleography maybe. I'm not sure, EC, small OG. Ah, uh, ECOG. Mm. If it's the, it's probably ECOG, electrocochleography. Yeah, the trust in panic one, the one that with the needle going through the, the eardrum, that's quite effective to, to diagnose many as disease, yes. Mm. And so I guess I'd say to everybody, because it's late, if anybody's got more questions, they could type them in in the next couple of minutes and maybe Selene can answer them later. John has been so comprehensive. Mm. I've learned so much personally. Thank you very much.